So we were reading on page 12, working with this difference between foreclosure and repression and negation too. And the idea behind foreclosure is that this is the basic mechanism for psychosis and the basic signifier that is foreclosed, that is refused, is a signifier of your own castration. The psychotic refuses to accept that they are not the only person in the room, on the road. Still reading on page 12. The subject's entire subsequent development shows that he wants to know nothing about it. Freud literally says, in the sense of the repressed. The psychotic doesn't want to know anything about the castration that, is, that comes with being integrated into a symbolic order, into a society. Again, castration, I can't emphasize this enough. It means prohibition. It means constraint. The types of constraints that come from living with others where you can't just do whatever the hell you want. If everybody did whatever the hell they want, wanted on the road, people would get hurt. If you just drove on any side of the road that you wanted to and everybody did the same thing, there'd be accidents left and right. If you got to decide, let's say, let's say everybody got to decide whether or not they wanted to stop at a red light. It was your choice. Yeah, the light is red, but you can decide whether to blow through it or stop. That'd be a disaster. Why? Because there would be accidents on every single corner because nobody would want to stop at the reds. Everybody would want to do exactly what they wanted to. And then somebody would decide to stop at the last minute. Somebody else trying to go through and everybody slamming into each other. It'd be a nightmare. Prohibition and constraint at the level of traffic lights, at the level of rules and regulations of the road, are a kind of castration because it says you can't just drive however the hell you want. The psychotic drives however the hell they want, which is oftentimes why they don't have driver's licenses. But let's get back to the book, page 12. What comes under the effect of repression returns, for repression and the return of the repressed are just like two sides of the same coin. Here Lacan is shifting back away from the psychotic and now back to the neurotic, who experiences repression. Remember the car accident? The signifier, leather? The signifier is repressed, and then the next time you smell leather or touch leather, that returns. That's called the return of the repressed. That's what he's talking about here. The repressed is always there, expressed in a perfectly articulate manner in symptoms and a host of other phenomena. Symptoms. Symptoms. When you encounter a leather jacket at the Goodwill store and you touch it, and you feel a little disgusted, or you kind of pull your hand away very quickly, that's a symptom. That leather jacket and your reaction is a symptomatic expression of a repressed relationship to a past traumatic event. This is a recorded lecture, so you can pause, back it up, and play that again if you need to. The point here is that that's a symptom and a symptom in this case, at the very start, remember we're here in 1955 and 56. Later in the 70s, Lacan's going to change his mind and talk differently about symptoms. But for right now, symptoms are symbols. Symptom, symbol. A symptom is a signifier of some underlying structure, some other issue. When you sweat, even though the temperature of the room hasn't changed, but instead because you're nervous, that is a symptomatic expression of an underlying clinical experience. Clinical in the sense that you could go to therapy and probably talk about it. That's symptoms. Normal people have symptoms. Now we come to the psychotic. They don't have symptoms. They have hallucinations delusions. Let's get to that. By contrast, what falls under the effect of Verwerfung has a completely different destiny. Remember, this is foreclosure. The neurotic symbolizes events 
represses and negates those events, shoving them into the unconscious. The psychotic forecloses the experience of symbolization, refusing to allow traumatic events like castration, like prohibition, like a car accident, let's say, refusing to allow them to be symbolized and by extension being unable to repress them. And as a result of that, not having an unconscious. That's important here. We'll come to talk more about this later, but the psychotic's relationship to the unconscious is a very interesting one. I think it's fair to say that the unconscious simply doesn't exist for the psychotic. Why? Because they know no difference between the voices that have been repressed and the voices that are on display. They got all the voices going at the same time. We'll come to that a little later. I think we'll add some more nuance to it. Maybe even saying that just their relationship to the unconscious is different. But just hold this thought for a minute. If the unconscious is a language, as Lacan says on page 11, and I'm telling you that the psychotic has a fraught relationship with the unconscious, that should also clue you in to the fact that the unconscious and language and the psychotic are all screwed up. The psychotic has a disturbed relationship to language. And that's how you detect psychosis. You detect psychosis at the level of linguistic disturbances. We're going to come to that a little later, I expect. But first, it's worth noting that the psychotic has a problem with language, with symbolicity, with the symbolic. And then at the bottom of page 12, he goes on and starts talking about this. At the top of 13, we start learning a little bit more. If the normal neurotic person represses signifiers of traumatic events in order to have those signifiers return in symptomatic form, the psychotic does something different. They foreclose, they refuse to symbolize these past traumatic events, and as a result don't have signifiers, and as a result have nothing to repress, and because they have nothing to repress, don't have an unconscious. That's the theory we're working with here. Notice what happens instead, top of page 13. Only it also happens that whatever is refused in the symbolic order in the sense of foreclosure, reappears in the real. Now that's interesting. One way to work this out in terms of the theories we've got right now is to say that in the case of the car accident, the psychotic refuses to allow that car accident to be symbolized and thus refuses the car accident itself. The effect Lacan is wagering here is that by refusing to allow the experience of that car crash to be symbolized, the psychotic wills its reappearance in the real. Now, the symbolic and the real have a difficult relationship. It's not too complicated to understand, but it does take a minute. The basic way to understand it is first, start by reading Dylan Evans' dictionary and look at the entrance look at the entries on the symbolic and the real the next thing i would say to hold in mind is that the real is every part of material reality that refuses symbolization it's the way that reality in the sense of materiality bites you the real is the snake under the rock that strikes your leg as you walk by, causing you to ah, shriek. The real is the shingle that slides off the roof and lands on your head as you walk by the building. The real is the knock at the door, the alarm on your phone that wakes you from your dream. It's that part of reality that emerges as a surprise, stunning you, sometimes shocking you. The real, encounters with the real, are always at some level kind of traumatic. 
It's surprising when you encounter some part of your reality that you can't symbolize. It can provoke laughter. It can drive you to tears. It can produce shock and awe. And the reason why you experience all these things is because it's tough to symbolize them. And all you can do is oftentimes have an effective grunt, groan, scream, or something like that in response to an encounter with the real. The symbolic is the world in which everything is in its place, has a name, and all the names are connected to each other. The real is also a world where everything is in its place, but not in any way that allows you to control it. So what we're saying here is that the psychotic, by refusing to allow the car crash to become a symbolic element, wills its repetition in the real. What does that mean? It means the psychotic person walks down the street and re-experiences the car crash, even though there's no car crash. They jump into the bushes thinking a car is about to crash into them. That's a psychotic experience because what you see when you look at that is no car crash, no car getting ready to crash into them, but not so with them. They are hallucinating. They are seeing in the real something that they refused to symbolize at the level of the symbolic. Reappear is an important word here at the top of page 13. The event of the car crash reappears in their phenomenal field in the form of a hallucination. So if you go down on page 13 to that middle paragraph, the last line or two, last sentence here, the relation that Freud establishes between the phenomenon and this very special knowing nothing of the thing, even in the sense of the repressed, expressed in this text translates as this. What is refused in the symbolic order reemerges in the real. So here we have a re repetition of what Lacan has basically said, knowing nothing of the thing, refusing to know anything about the car crash that they actually experienced back in the day, allowing the car crash then to reemerge in the real, but only as, check this out, a hallucination. Next paragraph. There is a close relationship between, on the one hand, negation, and the reappearance of the purely intellectual order in the purely intellectual order of what have, has not been integrated by the subject and on the other foreclosure and hallucination that is the reappearance in the real of what the symbolic has refused the first describes the neurotic negation and the reappearance in the purely intellectual order of what has not been integrated by the subject the second refers to the psychotic, foreclosure and hallucination, the reappearance in the real of what the symbolic has refused as a hallucination. They are hallucinating in the sense that they are seeing something that they perceive to be real, but that nobody else can see. They think it's real. That's the hallucination. That's the reappearance in the real that Lacan is talking about. The reason why the psychotic experiences hallucinations is caught up in their refusal to symbolize a previous traumatic event, in this case, a car crash. A little bit further down on page 13, about six lines from the bottom, the essential distinction is this. The origin of the neurotic repressed is not situated at the same level of history in the symbolic as that of the repressed involved in psychosis, even if there exists a close relationship between their contents. What normal people do when they symbolize traumatic events and then repress these symbols only to have them return in symptomatic expressions later is very different. But how different? Exactly from the psychotic experience of refusing to symbolize a traumatic event, thereby having nothing to repress, thereby having no source of input for the unconscious, and provoking in turn not a symptomatic return of the repressed, but instead the hallucination 
allowing them to feel like the car crash is happening again and again and again. They don't just jump in the bushes once. They're constantly jumping in bushes every time a car passes because they're hallucinating and thinking that they are experiencing the car crash again in its entirety. This is our first introduction to psychosis.